symplectic geometry and moment maps. Now, I would like to start with one more application of the Moser lemma. Um, uh, I must say I was a little bit hesitant because like last time we looked at some applications and those were more or less easy applications even though in one of them I made a mistake. Uh, now this is a considerably more involved application but um, since later on perhaps we'll need some even more advanced versions and I don't want to prove all of them. I would like to show you at least one more advanced thing which is proved by Moser and um, show you at least a, a sketch of the proof to, to, to show how how it works. Right, so the uh, setup will be as follows. We have M omega, a symplectic manifold, and L and M in Lagrangian submanifold. So recall this means that for all points of L, the tangent space to L inside the symplectic vector space given by the tangent to the ambient manifold together with the value of the symplectic form at M is a symplectic subspace. So our first goal today um, is to obtain some kind of normal form or model of the symplectic structure of M near L. You can say that this, this will be a version of Darbu, right? Darbu uh, was the following. We were choosing a point somewhere in M and on the neighborhood of uh, that point we wanted to understand how the symplectic structure looks like. So now instead of a point we choose the whole submanifold and we want to see how the symplectic structure uh, on M looks like on the neighborhood of the submanifold. <coughs> no, that's the analog of the boom. Um, so before going into it, um, I will start with several uh, preliminaries. So one of them, uh, let's look back into symplectic linear algebra a little bit. So, um, so let's look at the following setup. We have V omega, a symplectic vector space, and we have L inside V a Lagrangian subspace. So then, well, Let's introduce this notation. Let's just denote by I the tautological embedding of L into V. So then we already saw this picture once, I believe. We know that V is isomorphic to V star by means of this uh, map omega flat. Right? So it identifies V and V star. Now, duly to this embedding L to V, there is a projection V star to L star, right? Just by duality. 
So here there is a projection L star. Now maybe just uh, just a small remark. Uh, so this uh, sequence of maps is exact in the following sense. If you take a composition of everybody, you get zero. Uh, why is that? exactly but close to it so let's think what's what's what, what's already this this piece of the map right so uh, let's say I star Omega flat where does it map a vector X so Omega flat maps it to a linear form, omega of x dot, right? And that's, that's the place for the argument. Now, what does I star do? It restricts this form to L, right? So I'm only interested in what it's going to do on L. Now, what, what it's going to do on L? Uh, it would substitute elements of L here, right? But then L is Lagrangian. So x, uh, right, so it would substitute elements of L here. Uh, so if I uh, compose this i, this would mean that uh, this guy x should be from L. Now if it is from L, so if it is in the image of i, this means it is from L, and then if X and Y are both from L, then this guy is zero, right? right. Okay, so this composition is zero. So we know that that this guy is injective, right? This is just a tautological embedding of a subspace in the ambient vector space. And, and of course, th this guy is subjective. Just, it's a, just a dual map. Now their composition is equal to zero, right? The dimension of L plus the dimension of L star is equal to the dimension of V, right? So this actually means that I star composed with omega flat induces an isomorphism from V mod L to L star, right? The map descends to V mod L because L is in the kernel. Uh, so the dimension of this guy is equal to the dimension of that guy. The map is subjective, so it has to be an isomorphism. Again, I'm not sure. Maybe you can find a more elegant way to say it. 
But uh, so whenever you have a Lagrangian subspace, then uh, the quotient of the total space by this subspace is isomorphic to L star. Okay, so we'll need that. So that's that's the first thing. We'll need that very soon. Maybe the the last remark um, over here. So this isomorphism uh, is um, uh, induced by this form omega, right? So there is the the dual of the embedding, but there is also this omega flat. So omega flat plays an important role there. So one more thing that I want to recall. Um, so from differential geometry. So that's the notion of the normal bundle. So suppose we have M manifold. X inside M is submanifold. So then we can organize the following sequence of vector bundles. So we, we, we have a tangent bundle of X. We can actually take the tangent bundle of M and restrict it to X. So then the, uh, the fiber will be the full tangent space to M but only over the points of x. Of course, here there is an embedding. And what we can do, we can continue this sequence to the quotient. So we take quotients of the corresponding spaces. So this is called the normal bundle of x. So these are all So these are all bundles of x. Now let's look at the situation when actually uh, M is a symplectic manifold and we have a Lagrangian submanifold inside. Symplectic and L inside M. So then what's going to happen? So we have, for instance, choose a point of L. So let's look at this sequence. So we have the tangent space to L. It injects into the tangent space to M. And it now projects to the quotient. So which is by definition the fiber of the normal bundle. Now, you see, that's, uh, that's exactly the picture we just had on the other blackboard. So this is symplectic. And this is Lagrangian. So this means that this quotient NML is isomorphic to the dual of this guy. So the dual of this guy is a fiber of the cotangent bundle to L. All in all, what this means, so I did it point-wise, but of course it works at all the points. So actually, we have a bundle isomorphism between the um, between the normal bundle to L and the cotangent bundle to L. So let me recall from when was it uh, two lectures back. Uh, so this is actually by itself a symplectic manifold, right? So this guy is symplectic. 
with symplectic structure omega naught. So there, there is some canonical symplectic structure. So one more preliminary. So one more preliminary from differential geometry. which goes under the name of the tubular neighborhood theorem. So it tells you how the, uh, how a neighborhood of a manifold, of a submanifold looks inside a manifold. So let me recall or tell you how it is, and maybe you can tell me how familiar you are with this statement. So uh, suppose we have M a manifold, X inside M a submanifold. Um, so then there is a, an open neighborhood of X inside M and a neighborhood of X which is considered now as a zero section of the normal bundle of X Right, so this is a vector bundle, so X is naturally sitting inside it. So neighborhood of X in an X. And a diffeomorphism from V to U such that uh, the following things hold true. So if you restrict F to this zero section X, you will get an identity map which maps this copy of X to that copy of X. So maybe I draw a picture before I discuss um, the condition two, which is slightly more technical. Uh, so here, how you can imagine it. So there is this M inside M somewhere sitting X. And so this tubular neighborhood U eventually something, something like this. Um, right, now we have another copy of X and over X we have a vector bundle. So that's how I try to draw the total space of the vector bundle. Well, maybe not very successfully. So that's the vector bundle and X. And here inside, inside an X we have V. And that's a model. So the, this neighborhood, uh, tubular neighborhood of, uh, of X in V is a model of what happens near X in U. So we say that there is a diffeomorphism F from this guy to that guy. And if you have a point X 
only two copies of x, then f, let me see that I have one more visible color. Right, so the, the point will be mapped by f <coughs> to itself. Uh, yeah, before I talk about the condition two, uh, kind of let me ask you, kind of, everybody is more or less familiar with that, right? So everybody saw it. So then tell me what, what is this condition two? Uh, is it essential to put B? Sorry? Uh, is it essential to put B with a neighborhood of X? I mean, couldn't we say simply that NX is a, is a only more a different one to whatever to B? Um, let's say we probably, we, 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 we probably can, but uh, for later use it's going to be inconvenient because certainly as it is uh, uh, stated now, doesn't matter so much because I don't put much of a structure on NX. Uh, but once we, uh, you know, our target is to do it in symplectic geometry. This means that all these gadgets, they will carry some symplectic forms. And then here, of course, doesn't matter so much some kind of uh, open neighborhood of zero in the fiber or the whole fiber, right? You can always find a diffeomorphism which will kind of send any reasonable open neighborhood to the whole fiber. But it will be inconvenient in the case of um, uh, some, when you add symplectic structures because they are kind of already this, this, this gadget has some volume and the volume or fiber has an infinite volume so it, it's, it's, it's not going to be. So the statement, yeah, I agree with you, the statement would be roughly the same at the level of differential geometry without much extra structure. All right, so tell me, um, uh, what else can we require? From this map, maybe just a hint. So I would like to discuss uh, what can we say about the derivative of f or the push forward map f star restricted to x, right? So uh, at this point, there is a tangent space. And at that point, there is a tangent space. So they are mapped to each other by the derivative of the F map. So what can we say about it? Um, well, so suppose we restrict it to some point x of x. So here we have a tangent space to the normal bundle and it is mapped to the tangent space to M. Of course, this is an isomorphism because F is a diffeomorphism. Now, uh, what can we say about these two gadgets? So this one, about this one, we already know something, right? So there is, uh, there is a following natural sequence Txx and here Nxx. What about this tangent bundle? Exactly. So this one is naturally split because yeah, look at this point, right? It's an intersection of two submanifolds. One submanifold is a zero section, so the other submanifold is just a fiber, right? So this means that Tx and x is canonically split. So it's a tangent space to the zero section plus the, uh, we can say just plus the fiber of the normal bundle. So this is because x is exactly the intersection of x with a fiber. Uh, 
you know, I, I would like to require for this map to be identity. But unfortunately, it does not quite make sense, right? Because these two spaces, so, so, that's, so that's not the same space. It does, it's, it's not so clear what, what does it mean to say it's identity. What's the best thing I can ask for? Well, of course, I should ask for, and this is already obvious since F is identity on X, right? So this should be identity. This TXX should map to TXX. And this is already guaranteed. So this is the identity. And this is because, because F restricted to X is the identity of X. Then it's tangent is identity. Now, um, so this guy maps there. So what we can require? We can require that the composition to be identity, right? So that's, I think, the best. So we define, we define this arrow as a composition, so as this triangle commutes. And we want this guy to be an identity. But otherwise, we cannot really say that this is uh, that this is the same space, and it will lead to some interesting discussion. One can say it will lead to complications at the symplectic level. So that's uh, that's that's that that's what we actually require. We want uh, this uh, this F star map actually to define for us a splitting of this sequence. So since you uh, you know about tubular neighborhoods, you probably heard of how how the proofs work. So how would you typically think this would, this would be defined? What, what would one do? Of course, you can choose different methods, but what would be the standard way to define that? So the usual way how you prove tubular neighborhood theorems uh, you add a Riemannian structure on your manifold, and then you uh, start building this map by using some small geodesic rays, right? So you kind of, you take uh, uh, elements or vectors in your tangent bundle here, and you start building small geodesics to define a map from, uh, from the vector spaces, from the fibers, to the actual manifold, roughly speaking. For us, it's maybe not so interesting now, but the, the standard way how you would define such a splitting would be to choose a Riemannian metric on M and Define splitting by saying that uh, you just take the orthogonal to, to, the, to, to this guy with respect to the metric. This defines for you a splitting of the sequence, and you're just saying that. Uh, this uh, NXX is mapped to the uh, subspace which is split by the um, orthogonality. So that's how roughly it works. And it will play the role in a second. All right. Well, so much for preparations. Now we can state Einstein Lagrangian embedding theorem. Uh, 
Um, in fact, I don't want to rewrite everything. So I kind of, I assume that we already have the notation of the Tubio neighborhood theorem. And let me state it as follows. So M omega is symplectic. Um, L and M is a compact Lagrangian submanifold. Uh, so then, <coughs> so there is a tubular neighborhood. Tubular neighborhood, recall, this is uh, uh, a neighborhood of your submanifold in the normal bundle, a neighborhood of the, your manifold in the ambient space and the diffeomorphism between the two uh, such that f from v to omega zero. So this is inside ML, which is isomorphic to T star L. So that's why we have this symplectic structure there to u equipped with omega. So this is inside m. So there there is this the, the symplectic structure of omega. Is a symplectomorphism. So basically, it is telling us that, uh, of course, we know that, uh, now we know by the tubular neighborhood theorem that uh, a neighborhood of uh, a Lagrangian submanifold inside any symplectic manifold, it can be modeled on a, a neighborhood of the zero section in T star L. But moreover, T star L has its own symplectic structure, right? And it turns out that one can choose this, uh, uh, this diffeomorphism, which identifies the tubular neighborhoods such that symplectic structures also coincide. Right? It's, it's a kind of similar to Darbu, a very, very strong result. So basically telling you that whenever you have a neighborhood of a Lagrangian submanifold, there nothing unexpected can happen, similar to Darbu, right? Darbu, like symplectic structures, they are really very, very easy, just uh, some DQDP here. It's a very similar result in nature. More or less uh, all such results, or many such results, are proved using Moser. Uh, so let me start sketching the, the proof. So we'll start now, maybe just uh, these simple things, and then continue a little bit at the next hour. We'll need more complicated versions of this theorem and more advanced versions later on. But you see, my strategy is, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have less and less detailed proofs, right? Also, the proofs become more and more technical. You see, already our preliminaries took the whole hour. So, uh, so the sketch of the proof. So the, uh, the strategy is the same as for the uh, uh, proof of the Darboux theorem. Uh, we first choose the map which is wrong. And then we're going to correct it. So we choose those two bio neighborhoods. We choose a diffeomorphism. So we, ch we just use the standard two bio neighborhoods theorem. And we say, OK, well, so there are some neighborhoods of L. So here there is identity. And there is this story about the tangent bundles. 
right? Now, um, what happens? Of course, this is sitting inside, we can say, T star L. This is sitting inside M. They have symplectic structures. And what we can do, uh, we can consider the two symplectic structures, omega naught and F star omega, the pullback. So these are two symplectic structures on V. From now on, I would like to forget about this U. Right? So I import, using the tubular neighborhood theorem, I import my symplectic structure to V. And now I have two symplectic structures on V. I would like to use the Morse trick to identify them. Here there is one small problem. And so the Morse trick would work very smoothly if the restriction of these two forms on the, uh, let me put it this way, on the tangent space of M restricted to L, or tangent space to V restricted to L. So if these two things were the same, right? So in other words, so that's, that's the same as to say F star omega M is equal omega zero M for all M in L. So this would be highly desirable if this were true. Uh, unfortunately, um, nothing really guarantees that it is true. So, so in general, it is not true. Uh, so, um, in fact, there are several ways to deal with it. And in the next problem set, the first two exercises, they're about these two ways, how one can do it. So maybe let me prepare the blackboard for just after the break. And one way to deal with it will be to correct it. Correct it, this would mean to actually be more careful about choosing F, such that the equality would hold true. And the second way Except that maybe, maybe they're not the same, but do Moser anyways. All right, so let's make a break and then let's look at these two scenarios just after the break. All right, let's continue. So, so let me describe two strategies on how one can deal with this problem. So as, as I said, the first idea is to correct F, so to, to choose F more carefully. In fact, I will kind of make the statements, but you'll prove them in the next problem set. So, um, uh, so the first idea is to choose the uh, Riemannian metric, which will eventually give you the, the, uh, the map F. Um, metric on M, such that um,
G and omega are related by J and almost an almost complex structure. So there was an exercise in one of the first problem sets which was actually explaining that it is always possible to make such an arrangement. So it is possible to choose an almost complex structure and then you will have G like that. So um, if you use such a metric in defining the tubular neighborhood map, so then what's going to happen maybe, uh, yes, let me, uh, let me state it in this way. Then if one chooses this splitting, um, Right, so here we need to, to say that Cxx is equal to the uh, orthogonal complement uh, of the tangent space with this particular metric G. Then it will turn out that F star omega is actually equal to omega naught. And this is, um, and this is the topic of the first exercise that we have on the next problem set. Basically, it is telling you that this, uh, this uh, uh, embedding of NXX into the tangent space uh, is also Lagrangian. So the tangent space to the submanifold is a Lagrangian, and it turns out that how you embed the tangent space of the, uh, of the fiber also turns out to be Lagrangian. And this guarantees for you that the, uh, simplex, the pullback of the symplectic structure is standard. So that's the first possibility. So another possibility, so live with it. Um, it is the following lemma, and that's the second exercise on the problem set. So lemma says the following. Uh, suppose you have vector space V together with two different symplectic structures. So they're both symplectic. You have L in V which is Lagrangian for omega naught and omega one. So we denote by I as before the embedding of L into V. And we assume that so those maps that we were discussing in the beginning of the last hour, right? So we, we now have two maps from V mod L to L star. We assume that they are the same. So then it turns out that all the combinations which interpolate between omega naught and omega one, and actually even you can take T outside the zero one region, anywhere. They're symplectic. for all values of T. Right. In fact, uh, let's assume this lemma. So, okay, so that's, that's here, here there is a way kind of how you correct F and you, you get this equality, 
but you can actually live without correcting this equality. So suppose that's, that's life, that's how it is. They, maybe they're not the same. And um, uh, we're gonna continue the proof using, using the lemma. So the lemma you are proving for the next time. Uh, in fact, notice that we are exactly in this situation, in the situation described by the lemma locally, because uh, we have the tangent space to L, which is Lagrangian, both in T star L and in M, right? And uh, so these maps are the same. That's the condition that we were discussing, that the, remember, there was a commuting triangle with uh, uh, an X, which was put back to the, uh, to the tangent of M and then projected again. So that's, 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 that's this condition. So in fact, so what Lemma tells us it tells us that 1 minus t omega naught plus t f star omega is symplectic for all t and for all m on L. So the two symplectic structures perhaps do not coincide, but all their linear combinations, they are symplectic. So let's denote omega of t, this guy, one over t omega naught, plus t f star omega. Um, so all the difficulties or all the kind of problems or all the setup, we all concentrated in the first hour and in this discussion. From now on, we basically repeat almost verbatim what we were saying about Darbu last time. Right? After all, like, we have this tool, the Mosel Lemma, now we just use the Mosel Lemma. So let me just spell um, the steps. Uh, so we choose perhaps a smaller neighborhood V prime and V such that omega of T is symplectic on V prime for all T on zero one. Um, so after that, we consider the derivative d omega t over dt, and we notice that if we restrict it to L, then each of the forms restricted to L is zero, right? Because L is Lagrangian. Of course, the derivative of the comb linear combination, right? So this is what? This is T, this is F star omega minus omega zero restricted to L, and this is zero. Because L Lagrangian and T star L and M. Uh, so now, how is it the Poincaré lemma? Uh, did you look at the like kind of fibered version of the Poincaré lemma in the? Okay, let me just then state it. We, we're not going to do it in a detailed fashion. So uh, we are in the following situation, right? We have V, which is sitting inside the vector bundle NL, isomorphic to T star L. But actually, it can be, um, it can be a trivial neighborhood of a zero section in any vector bundle. Doesn't matter so much. So this is the 
total space of our vector bundle. Here inside, oops. So here inside is sitting the zero section. And we have a differential form omega, let's say omega k of v, such that d omega is equal to zero. And omega restricted to the zero section is also zero. So then recall, on a vector space, you know how to do the Poincaré homotopy, right? That how to, how to build a primitive. Now you can do exactly the same fiber-wise, right? So you introduce a scaling transformation which would shrink your neighborhood to zero just by multiplying your vectors in the fibers. And this would define for you those paths along which you can integrate when you want to build your primitive. Just, just do the same, but fiber-wise uh, as in Poincaré. So fiber-wise fiber Poincaré. So this will give you alpha. in omega k minus 1 of v, such that d alpha is equal to omega, and alpha on the zero section is zero. So alpha will be zero, sec uh, will be zero on the zero section. Recall, alphas, there, there are some kind of integrals, right, of arrays of some, something that you made of omega, right, in the Poincaré lemma. So those, uh, those integrals, they go over the parts which go from the origin of your vector space. Here, this would be a point on the zero section to the point where you can evaluate your alpha. But then if you're sitting on the zero section, this integral is over the interval which has zero lengths, right? So there is, there is nothing to integrate. So now when I'm saying those words, do they mean, you, you, you recall how the Poincaré lemma works or not? Okay. Right. So use the fiberwise Poincaré and uh, compute those primitives. So the so all so the forms which vanish on the zero section, they admit primitives, and those primitives you can also ask them to vanish on the zero section. So, uh, so we have d omega t over dt is equal to d alpha. In principle, in general, alpha depends on t, but here in this case, I think, kind of since this form is independent of t, alpha will be independent of t. So alpha restricted to L is zero. Now construct the Morse vector field. By the equation, the contraction with this Morse vector field applied to omega of t is minus alpha. So that's exactly the equation we had last time. So integrate. Mars vector field to a family of diffeomorphisms. C goes from zero to one and phi zero equal to identity. 
And here, when I say integrate, that's, of course, always a question. Can I integrate? And notice, I didn't try it. It's a diffeomorphism of what? So uh, now we started with an open neighborhood V. Now we shrink it to V prime, where uh, on V prime, omega of t is all everywhere non-degenerate for t between 0 and 1. So now we want to integrate the Moser vector field. Of course, it's not guaranteed that it integrates on V prime. So choose a possibly small of V double prime inside V prime, such that on V double prime, it actually integrates between 0 and 1. And phi t of V double prime is inside V prime. So make it smaller if needed. So then, Moser tells you that phi t star omega of t will be equal to omega of 0, which means, in particular, phi 1 star omega of 1 is, sorry, omega of 0, omega of 0. And this means phi 1 star f star omega is equal to omega 0. And this means that f composed with phi 1 is the Weinstein neighborhood map. So that's a symplectomorphism between the neighborhoods. Now, um, it was a long and difficult proof, this kind of buildup of various notions. And I kind of see I lost you a little bit, right? Because uh, uh, nobody's asking, you know, there was this condition for Lagrange and submanifold to be compact. Where are we using it? So, right, I mean, it was in the kind of, can, can we just drop it? Or was, where is it in the proof? Is it used in the proof somewhere? You know, I thought we were using it as the integral Yeah, in, in, exactly. In, that's, that's, that's this, when I say integrate, when I say I can choose this V double prime. <coughs> so here, it was essential the submanifold to be compact, so I, I take, uh, so my submanifold is compact. I take, uh, say, inside V prime, uh, say, some uh, uh, vibration with compact balls in each of the fibers. So I have a compact subspace of uh, V prime, and on this subspace, I start integrating my, uh, my vector field, and there, I can guarantee on some even smaller neighborhood uh, an integration. So otherwise, it wouldn't work, right? Or not necessarily. You also have this other approach, right? With uh, like choosing your, your tubular neighborhood map better. Yes. How does compactness come in there? Uh, no, but the, I mean, the Moser, so this step, let's say, uh, what what's going to, What's going to be like the, the other approach, right? What's the difference in the other approach? Here, I had to use this lemma to argue that uh, this guy is symplectic on the submanifold. Because it's symplectic on the submanifold, I can choose a neighborhood where it's going to be symplectic even outside, right? Now, if, uh, if, if I use the better map F, then uh, here, uh, on the manifold, this would be just the value of omega zero. So then, like, this, the, 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 this is needed. Like, I need to argue that this, uh, that the, uh, uh, my pass, the Moser pass of forms, it's always non-degenerate, at least on the manifold, then, and on the sub-manifold. And then, uh, this gives me a possibility to construct, to build a neighborhood on which it's uh, non-degenerate everywhere. 
So that's that's that that's that's for this point. So this this would only change this uh, this small piece. So here there would be a, another approach. But the rest of it would be the same. And here in the integration, you still you still need to integrate the Mosa vector field. So that's always true about any Mosa trick. You have to either have uh, compactness of your manifold, or you have to choose a compact subset and argue that there your vector field integrates. So there is no other, at least not to my knowledge, no other way to guarantee it. Right. So this is this is here. L compact is essential. Right. Okay, so um, let me do the following. Uh, let me state one more similar theorem. We're not going to prove it, but just just to tell you what are the other results. So one of the other results proved by Moser, and um, we're going to use it later on. And then maybe I give you a short preview of the next topic. So this goes under the name of the quasi-tropic embedding theorem. So there are different ways to state it, but let me let me do it in the following way. Uh, so I say that M has two symplectic structures. So I take I consider a submanifold X in M which is quasitropic for both omega zero and omega one. And I assume that <coughs> Omega one restricted to the tangent bundle of M over X is the same as Omega naught restricted to the same thing. Maybe one can also state it in the following way. Uh, for all x and x, TMM with omega naught M, or maybe, maybe better, yeah, maybe better this way, omega 1. M is just equal to omega naught M. Right? They are living in the same space. X. Yeah. Sorry. So then there are open neighborhoods
neighborhoods, any map. U0, omega 0, U1, omega 1. which is a simple ectomorphism. And of course, when restricted to X, it is equal to the identity of X. Let me now one comment, this theorem is in one way more complicated than the previous one because now we say that uh, the submanifold is quasi-isotropic. It's more general than Lagrangian. But on the other hand, it's kind of, in some sense, more easy, one can say, because um, I was comparing uh, my uh, neighborhood of a Lagrangian submanifold to, to, to some other standard manifold, this T star L, and the neighborhood there. Um, so why, why, why do you think here I'm doing it differently? I'm saying that there are those two different symplectic structures. Of course, one thing is to make it easier, but what can be the other reason? Right, before we were like for a neighborhood of a Lagrangian submanifold, we were building some standard model. Now we're not doing it for a quasi-tropic submanifold, because, because we kind of don't, don't, don't have a convincing standard model. That's right. In fact, we'll, we'll find some local normal forms or some standard models in the uh, moment map theory. So when we introduce more structure, then for our quasi-tropic submanifolds, there will be very good standard models. All right. So much about those normal forms for a moment, but uh, kind of uh, don't, don't I, I know maybe today it was slightly painful, right? But uh, don't, 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 don't let it kind of completely disappear from your mind because it will come back. Maybe not, not in such a gruesome form as today because from now on we assume we kind of know all that. So it will be more fluent, but, but we, we're gonna use the normal forms later on. Um, so um, from now on, I would like to combine uh, symplectic geometry with group actions. So we spent quite some time on linear, symplectic linear algebra and those basics, very beginning of symplectic geometry. But now let's see uh, what happens if we throw in the group actions. And for that, let me just uh, start discussing the group actions a little bit, recalling you what they are and setting up the basic definitions. And next time we try to proceed with mixing it with symplectic geometry. So. so group actions. So we're gonna consider a very special type of groups. So our groups will be compact connected like groups. <clears throat> and uh, our main examples will be the circle S1. the torus Tn, which is a product of a circle by itself and times. Um, of course, non-abelian compact connected Lie groups, we also want, want to talk about them, but I, I don't quite know, probably some of you know, know this story very well, some of you maybe, I, I, I'm not sure, everybody knows. Like, let me mention some examples and you tell me uh, how it feels. So, right, one group which is important for us that which we already mentioned in the course, is a unitary group. So these are 
n by n complex matrices and the uh, um, determinant is non-zero and uh, Hermitian conjugate coincides with the inverse, right? That's the unitary group. Inside is sitting special unitary. So these are unitary matrices. Uh, with determinant equal to one. Uh, this is of course uh, SO3. which are rotations of R3, SON, um, real N by N matrices, of determinant one, and such that the transpose coincides with the inverse. And so on. So um, how, so is it like, how easy it is for you talking about all this stuff? So that's straightforward? All right. And a little bit of representation theory for those things. Yes, no? Okay. Right. So let's say we have and a manifold. An action of G on M, so that's the standard notation. G acts on M, so this is so that that of course everybody knows, right? So that's a map G cross M to M. So the notation I'll be using sometimes is G dot M. Uh, of course, we require it to satisfy. the action rule, All right? So G acting on H acting on M is the same as the product in the group G times H acting on M. Now, um, maybe, um, maybe let me recall that um, if M is a vector space and the action is by linear transformations of M, so then we say that the The action is a representation of G. Um, so let me also recall maybe the following facts, which are easy facts, but you've got to tell me whether you, you know it. Suppose that we is a real vector space. And suppose that rho map from the circle to endomorphism of V is a representation. Maybe just one formula to be slightly more concrete. We can think of the circle
for instance, uh, as a segment 0, 2 pi, the 0 identified is 2 pi, right? That's one possibility. So then here, an, an element of a circle would be an angle theta, which is a real number, modulo 2 pi. And so the, uh, this uh, representation property tells us that rho of theta 1 composed with rho of theta 2 is equal to rho of theta 1, theta 2. And here the sum is taken modulo 2 pi. Right? So this is uh, inequality in endomorphism of V. Right? So this is, um, this is a definition of a representation of a circle on a vector space, on a real vector space. So then the fact is as follows. Um, it turns out that V admits a direct decomposition into the subspaces such that rho is a direct sum of, uh, let's say, 1 to k of rho i's, where rho i is an endomorphism of the i. Uh, and so the pair the pairs rho i, v, v i rho i are taken from the following list. So either the i is isomorphic to R and rho i is mapping the circle to 1 for all theta. So this is called the trivial representation. Or the i is isomorphic to R2. And rho i of theta is given by, let, let, me, let me write a matrix if you don't mind, right? This endomorphism of R2, I'm going to write as a 2 by 2 matrix. Cosine and i theta, sine and i theta, minus sine and i theta, cosine and i theta, where and i is an integer which is not equal to zero. Right. So again, a question, how familiar, obvious is it? That is it what you expect? So some of you probably, yeah, some of you probably know it very well. Some of you see it for the first time, right? Uh, so, um, um, right, I, I suggest that uh, we, we accept this, this fact. Maybe for those of you who have never seen it, maybe we need to talk and maybe I'll give you some extra whatever, some extra explanations about it. Uh, so some of the words, uh, some of the words that one, one says about it, right? So reps of S1. Uh, completely reducible. Completely reducible, this means they admit such decompositions. And the list that I gave you here, so this list is called irreducible reps of S1. 
So um, for those of you who, who have never seen it, the task is check that these guys are representations. So take the, the, the things on the list and check that they are indeed representations of S1 in the sense that I, that I defined here. Uh, one more thing about the terminology. So the integers and i are called weights. So the ni is the weight of the representation vi. The collection of ni's is a collection of weights of the representation v. By definition, to, uh, to the one-dimensional representation, we assign an i equal to zero. So non-zero n i's correspond by this uh, rule to the two-dimensional representations. And the one-dimensional representation, it has no n i because it's not defined by this formula, but we simply say that the corresponding n i is zero. In fact, you can use the formula and put n i equal to zero. Then what's going to happen? So this matrix will degenerate. Here, uh, this will be zero, this will be zero, this will be one, and this will be one. So it will split into a sum of two representations of, this, of that type. So it, it kind of makes sense. Even though n i equal to zero, strictly speaking, it would give you a kind of two representations of that type. Right. Uh, let me finish with one more with one more formula of the same type. And then, uh, so I formulate the question and then you try to guess what the, what the answer is. So now I want to say that uh, Tn, which is a product of circles, acts on V. vector space over R. So then V is a sum of the I's. Rho is a sum of rho I's. And the I is taken from some list. So what would you say? What's the list? So now, you, instead of one circle, you have n copies of a circle. Was this something with homogeneous polynomial? Sorry? Was this something with homogeneous polynomial? What was the difference between Let's say, maybe one can, perhaps one can make it talk. Perhaps one can make the answer talk to homogeneous polynomials. But but the answer is actually easy. Let's, let's say, for sure, one can formulate it in a much easier way. So what, what's, what's the answer? So those who know the answer, don't hesitate to tell me. Those who don't know the answer, don't hesitate to guess, right? You see, here is the experimental material. You know how the answer for S1 looks like. What, what do you think? How the answer for S1 cross S1 cross S1 cross S1, many copies of S1, how the answer going to look like? What do you think? N, wedges, uh, N like products of the first or N products of the second. I mean, I'm not sure if I think mm -hmm. I want to have. But, but let's, let's, let's negotiate already the first entry, right? There will be some list. Here, the first entry was a very, very easy representation. Would it, would a similar thing occur on the, on the other list? What do you think? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, right? That's here, that, that's, that's a safe bet, right? The I equal to r and rho of any element is equal to 1. Already maybe one test question. What do you think? Are there going to be other one-dimensional reps?
Not really, right? That's difficult to believe. So then, okay. Think about, think about it, but well, I mean, I, I tell you the answer. No other one dimensional reps, so that's not true. Now, what about two dimensional reps? So here, after all, there were one dimensional reps, then there were two dimensional reps. So what can you imagine as two dimensional reps? Is it trivial or n minus one under the normal Sure, that's a possibility. You're, 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 you're saying kind of send all the, uh, all the other circles to one and choose one and then use the formula. That's certainly a possibility, but are there more options? Can you just choose a way for each Cartier as well? Right, so let's say vi isomorphic to R2. Now rho i, and now we have uh, we have n copies of the circle, so there are n angles. We have to produce some convincing two by two matrix. And if I understand correctly what, what you're saying, uh, and maybe, okay, let me, sorry, let, let's choose, let's say k. Otherwise, there will be a, a confusion in notations. Yeah. And k, theta k. And then the rest of it feel in the same way as I did before. Um, so exercise. Check that this is a representation for n for n1 and k in z to the power k. And of course, we assume that the vector is not equal to 0 because otherwise we, we, we get the same effect as before. It becomes 1, 0, 0, 1, the matrix. So, um, so check that this is indeed a representation. Now, uh, what else? Right, so we had one dimensional representations and two dimensional representations. What are the other options? Are, are we gonna have something else which doesn't split? So that's especially for people who uh, who know the, uh, the story or who, who learned about representations. Of course, those who see it for the first time probably is difficult to guess. Now, what about people who, who know the story? Are there gonna be other entries? Sorry, I just, um, is it that uh, none of the MIs are zero or they're No, the, 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 the vector is non-zero, which means there is at least one of them which is non-zero. So, what does it conceal in I was, I was, I was just thinking about uh, two facts that arise in my mind when, when, we speak about, when we speak about representations and about representations of torus, for example. Yeah. So, first of all, that uh, 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 if uh, we have a family of commuting uh, operators, then like in uh, over over C, we would have uh, a basis where all of them are simultaneously organizable. Yes. And the second thing is that like over R, um, what we have... Okay, the, the, the statement, let's say, doesn't seem to, to be like... Maybe, but may, maybe even one of them is not diagonalizable, not, not even simultaneously, right? But okay, doesn't matter. Yeah, and the other thing is that well, uh, uh, over R, what we always have uh, about like any um, no. So in R, we always expect two types of blocks, like one by one block and like the rotation, uh, the two by two block that arises from rotation. It seems like I can, can't expect anything more. All right. Yeah. In fact. That's the good news. That's, that's a complete list. 
um, how is it, again, how comfortable are you with the story? Do you want, maybe for next, next time, do you want me to at least give you whatever, maybe hints of the, the proofs or? All right, so let me, let, let me think. Maybe next time I, I, I decide. Uh, I think the, the results are beautiful and clear. In principle, we can live with them as they are. But uh, maybe I'll think either, either next time or next time I'll tell you that separately for those people who want, we'll organize a session with more explanations of this story. But these, these, are, these are very beautiful results that we're going to use a lot in, uh, in the moment map theory and in applications to uh, symplectic geometry. So these are elementary, very basic, very, very important results. So representations of the circle, representations of the torus. Of course, representations of non-abelian groups, uh, as you probably heard, this is a much more involved story. It's a similar story, but already this one we really need. All right, so that's it for today. We continue next time with group actions. <laughs>